Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday to you. Uh, this is Billy McDermott. I'm the, the Customer Advocacy Director here at Candidate ID. Um, hope you've all had a fantastic week and I'm delighted that you were able to join us today. Um, I'm uh, particularly delighted to be joined um, by uh, Laura Farrell um, from McCurroch. Laura is the head of recruitment for McCurroch. Um, she is a Candidate ID client. Um, Laura, good afternoon. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Um, and Laura today is going to going to help me um, talk about the, some of the work that we did uh, with McCurroch to to automate the building um, of their talent pipelines. Um, but also to, uh, more importantly, uh, or not more importantly, but as importantly, automate their GDPR. You know, we we are, you know, uh, what six months in um, to, 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 you know, since GDPR, I think we can all agree it was probably a bit, um, a bit Y2K um, in terms of um, ambulance chasing consultants and that type of thing. Obviously, Candidate ID excluded from that, um, you know, build, building up a storm uh, before uh, b beforehand. Um, but actually, you know, there still is quite a lot of important work that, that um, has to continue um, to make sure that your, your uh, recruitment processes, whether you work in-house, whether you work in agency, are compliant with, with GDPR. And during the next um, 30 minutes to 40 minutes, um, Laura and myself hopefully will give you some ideas and some insight into, into that um, and give you some tips that you can implement into your business. Laura, um, would you like to kick off by, by telling the audience um, a little bit more about McCurroch? Because if, if, you, um, if you're not in Scotland or, or don't work within, um, within retail or technology, then uh, perhaps it's a brand that, that, that you wouldn't be aware of. So a little bit of insight into, into the business and, and what you actually do. Yeah, of course. Um, so McCarrick, we are a field sales organisation. Um, we work with some very big brands within the retail sector and also technology and financial services sectors. Um, so you will probably know the, the brands that we work with very well. Um, so the likes of PepsiCo, Unilever, Nestle, um, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, to name a few of those. And, and what we do is we represent those brands within the, the retail environment to help them sell more. Um, so they outsource their field sales teams to us. Um, and we operate UK and Ireland wide. So the, the when people always ask me, what do McCurroch do? Then then one of the kind of obvious things that I say is, look, see when you're in Morrison's and you're at the Heineken aisle um, and you see um, someone, you know, um, you, with, a, with a tablet um, taking information about where Heineken's positioned um, yeah. you know, compared to its comp competitors, do you know, that's that's the type of work that, that, yeah. that McCurroch do. Yeah, exactly. That. That's it. Plus a lot more as well. So you know, when you see yeah. people training, training in uh, in PC World or Curry's PC World for Hewlett Packard and, and that type of thing as well. Um, yeah. so so it's a you know a, a really really interesting. I, I'm fortunate enough actually to to have you know um, engaged with McCurroch a couple of different things for um, di different um, and different companies that I've worked with, and I've always been really impressed by um, by the business. Always been in, um, impressed by by the innovation, and and I was really pleased that we got the opportunity. Laura, um, to work with you um, on on this project. Um, the, this is just a little bit more information um, about the business, um, about the, the number of vacancies that you you, you typically you typically hire. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about your challenge at the beginning of the year? Because I think it was probably about February time where yep. we spoke, Laura, um, and and what your particular challenge and and your recruitment team was at that point. Sure. So we have a, an in-house recruitment team. We're based in, in Glasgow, but we cover the whole of the UK and Ireland. Um, and we had um, a database. So we use ISIMS as our ATS. Um, so we, we are very lucky that we, we do attract a high number of call, um, candidates to our, our business. Um, but having a, quite a small recruitment team, um, what we struggle with is the, the engagement side of things. So we um, last year alone, we had just under 14,000 people apply to our business. Um, and we fill between 700 and 1,000 roles per year. Um, having a recruitment team of around four or five advisors, um, obviously we, we, we struggle to keep in contact with everybody that applies for the roles because uh, our roles are mainly field-based. Um, if you apply for a role and you're not within the catchment area, within a certain 
um, number of miles um, for the ideal postcode for that role. That unfortunately the, the team um, wouldn't wouldn't have a chance to pick up with you um, because that you wouldn't be deemed as suitable for that particular role. Um, so what had happened, having done quite a few nationwide campaigns over the last couple of years, we had just um, over 48,000 candidates on our, our database and a large number of those had not been spoken to. Um, and they could be absolutely fantastic candidates, but we just didn't have the manpower to um, engage with absolutely everybody. Um, and then obviously with GDPR looming, that's when we picked up with yourself. One, one of the other aspects from from a you know th th there's two clear clear opportunities when we began to work with you the first was obviously to realize the potential of of placements um and 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 what that looked like but but the other thing was the the business risk associated with gdpr so because um and and this is really typical and, and i've worked with a number of high volume clients uh, in addition to working in a high volume agency environment as well you, you can have you know you know your team processes could be you receive a, an applicant from a job board and um, that person isn't suitable the person hasn't got any hasn't had any engagement because they're not suitable and your team doesn't have the capacity to, to contact them but instead of actually not retaining that person's information which would probably be best practice then that they're actually stored on your ATS or your CRM anyway. So, you know, the, the candidate hasn't had any engagement. Yes, the candidate has consciously applied. However, the candidate might not really be aware of who they've applied to. So yeah. because the candidate doesn't know, you know, who, um, in fact, they've, they've really sent their, their job application to, um, and because there's been no engagement since the point of application, um, the, the you know, sim simply put, you know, you shouldn't necessarily be holding holding that that candidate's information. However, because of the capacity issue, because the team simply don't have, and, and again, this is typical, you know, of, of high volume co um, agencies and in house teams. You know, you you can't say for certain that actually just because someone hasn't been contacted, it's you know, it's not that they they weren't suitable. It's actually perhaps they were missed. Perhaps a call yeah. was made, the candidate didn't call back. An email was sent, the, the, the candidate didn't. Email Email back so there's absolutely placements with, within that and I think a, a lot of businesses make an assumption that the um, applicants that are stored on an ATS or a CRM that they're what, what Scott who I work with um, describes as the fish heads you know it's the people you don't want to speak to absolutely you know there's going to be a number of, of those fish heads but actually there's there's also gold in them hills you know there is actually people within there who who can be spoken to so yeah. so that's that's where the opportunity of gdpr comes in because you know if and and there are still businesses guys who i'm speaking to um and i was speaking to some businesses um the other the other day actually um you know, I was, I was speaking in front of an agency audience who actually, when I did a straw poll, only about 30 percent, you know, three out of 10 um, of the attendees have actually done anything really proactive about um, about their GDPR. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the, there still is a massive opportunity if you haven't. Now, there's also some big, massive brands out there. There are big brands who we all know, um, one in particular, there's a big consumer brand who I've been speaking to over the past couple of months, you know, who have got millions of records on their ATS who still haven't done anything either either about it so but don't don't be frightened if you haven't done anything related to GDPR if you haven't taken any proactive action as of yet <clears throat> don't be frightened about it you can actually still still do it and we'll, we'll talk about some of the some of the things that, that, that you can do throughout this uh, throughout this webinar <clears throat> so that's just again that that slides actually just highlighting us I should have should have moved on so j just before we go into to, to what we actually carried out with yourselves, um, Laura, I just want to, to to illustrate a little bit about what what's changed um, in terms of, you know, the, the recruitment market. Certainly in the past 13 years since I've started in recruitment, I started in 05, recruiting in the financial services market. When when I started, we were um, you know constantly pushing out content, but it was only job related content in the main. We might have had some insight, we might have had some analysis, but very much it was about pushing out adverts and talking to candidates about job vacancies. Now there's so much information available online through multiple different channels, whether that's social, whether that's online, whether it's offline, whether it's press, um, you know wh whatever it is, there's so much information there that candidates are very easily able to make up their own minds about your employer, um, about your company, um, about whether they're an employer of choice without the intervention of, of, of a recruiter. It's a very, very different market compared to, to now. And this is where you know the idea of candidate ID came from. It came from the idea that 
actually all those candidates who we were approaching um, on behalf of our clients and our sourcing business, we were you know, wasting a lot of data. We weren't maximizing the opportunity. You know, out of every 100 candidates who were being approached, you know, perhaps one or two were being hired, but there's still 98 people there. You know, and even if you assume that maybe a third of those aren't suitable, there's still people who are going to be looking for a job in the future. There's still going to be at least 60 of those people are going to be interested in your organization in the future. So keeping in touch with them with this content, this recruitment marketing content, um, to raise awareness, to educate the candidate, to give the candidate enough information to make up their mind about your brand as an employer of choice. That's really important. And that's what we do um, at candidate ID. We allow you to track the candidate's activity across a mul multiple different channels, and we allow you to score against uh, against that and, and that's what we did with with, with McCurroch. um laura do you want to talk about um the, the process that we had you know because we, we were the, the way we were dealing with your gdpr compliance was to re-engage with those four to eight thousand yeah. candidates um across two primary channels which were email uh, and were text message yeah. um, do, do you want to to, to perhaps talk about actually how we, we worked with McCurroch, um, how we worked with your market, marketing team and with your recruitment team in order to pull together the, the right type of content? Yeah, of course. Um, so as you said, um, a lot of the candidates who applied to us didn't really know, know much about, about us. So we the first thing we wanted to do is make sure they understood the big brands that we, we worked with and the different opportunities we have within the business. Um, as you mentioned, we have the, the technology side of the business, which is more training. Um, the, the staff in stores to sell more for Microsoft and HP um, and then we have the, the retail or the grocery side of the business as well and also our financial side, um, services side of the business also. So we, we decided to send out um, different email campaigns with um, information on each of those so we didn't want to overload them with, with information or jargon. We kept it quite short and snappy but with links to um, some information that actually was actually on our website or we had it online elsewhere and it just pointed them in the right, right direction um, and some of it was quite interesting so we had a day in the life of a Microsoft, Microsoft territory manager for example um, we had some information about people within our business that um, what their career journey has been with us uh, it just it just gave a lot more detail in, in the one place um, so that the, the people that had applied to us were uh, re-engaged and, and understood a bit more about us the, the good thing about McCurroch, um, Laura, and it's one thing I've always loved, um, you know, referring to my example earlier when I was saying, you know, if you, you see someone walking about Morrison's looking at Heineken, then they're probably a McCurroch employee. As soon as you make it real, so as soon as you use one of one of the brilliant examples we've spoken about is the, the Magnum stuff that you can see on the yeah. screen there. Okay. You know, when you talk about the... the, the you know the the work that's done in the the magnum pop-ups you know whether it's brighton or oxford street or or whatever it's actually been and and people people relate to that it's it's job related content but it's not selling jobs you know it's going actually did, did you know that actually it's not magnum it's not walls that actually do this we actually do it on behalf of, of walls did you know yeah. that and and curry's pc world actually it's not hp and it's not microsoft it's actually our guys who are out doing training with customers and doing training training with staff as well and, and that's why do you know that the, 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 you, you do have some employer brand content actually, but actually your entire website for me is very much focused around around what you do and, and, and taking that story um, out, to, out to candidates is actually a really interesting thing to do. People don't know who you are, but you make it re real by, by linking, linking the brands up. And actually we didn't create um, any original content I, I don't think for this campaign laura um we, we reworked um everything from from your website so um you know from what we do you know for our work careers and all that type of thing you know we we turned this into into content that can be sent out over text message and and, and by email um to the candidates that was definitely one of the biggest concerns when we started billy that was that it was going to be a lot of work for us um but we were very lucky that um your guys did help us find the information there um, and we were also very lucky that our website had just been redone recently as well so there was a lot of new information on there and um, so it was it was fresh information for most people that had applied to us and and where we we started to you know that this guy's is a, a, a sample con candidate nurturing map if you're ever looking for content suggestions you know then get in touch we'll, we'll be more than happy to send this over to you um or, or talk to you further about it 
you, you kind of quickly get yourself into a position where actually you have lots and lots of stuff that you can talk to candidates about. Um, you, you, a lot of companies, particularly B2B brands, think that, um, and I've had a lot of conversations actually relating to GDPR where people go, but, but we've got nothing to say, so how are we supposed to re-engage candidates? How are we supposed to, to refresh their base as a process? And um, do you know if we've got nothing to talk about? Actually, most businesses do have something to talk about. They, they will have sales and marketing content that's on the website. They, they will have um, information that's probably been used, you know, by their, their sales function that, that maybe isn't live, but actually with a couple of adjustments could be put onto the website or could put onto a landing page or something like that. Do you know, there's, there's lots and lots of opportunity to it. So, you know, as, as Laura said, yeah, absolutely. Do you know, you... Um, you know, don't be concerned about um, content being a bottleneck. Um, you know, content can be very easily put put together, uh, and we're happy to talk talk to anyone about that um, if if they so wish. The 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 other aspect from from a content, you know, having enough content um, is really important in my opinion from a GDPR perspective, because you want to have enough content to maintain regular contact. One of the key principles um, for me of, of data privacy, particularly when you want to engage with people on an ongoing basis, is to make sure that the candidate, in a recruitment context, make sure that the candidate isn't surprised to hear from you. So, so that's, that's important. That means that the, the content has to be regular. It has to be timely. You know, it, it depends on your objectives, but I, I would suggest your your database you should be at least sending out one piece of content to them every two to three weeks. <clears throat> it needs to be you know strong enough content that it builds a relationship with the candidate. So um, it it does you know exp you know give the candidate a reason to to continuously engage with the content. Because one thing that we did, Laura, w with yourselves, and I think this is the the right thing to do, is that over the duration of this project, what we wanted to do was retain the candidates who engaged um, with, with the content, because there isn't any point in you know you retaining candidates who don't engage. There isn't any point in you wasting time, wasting storage on your ATS, um, sending out job alerts to candidates who simply simply aren't aren't engaging. So you, you know, in order to build that relationship, it, it has to be good enough content that as many people in the in the database um, engage uh, engage as yep. possible. Um, and in fact, in, in your campaign. Um, it, it was about 58%, if I remember rightly. I'll, I'll get the final figure once we go on. But a, a significant proportion of the database did actually engage with the campaign. Now, yeah. if you if you compare that to typical open rates and um, and typical engagement rates, you know, normally even in-house teams are probably only engaging with about 15% of their database um, over over. Uh, an annual period of time so to be able to reach almost 60 percent of your database um and on a project basis um is is, is a real achievement so I, th I think we i think we got the content um, more or less spot on uh, right. when it came to that um now one of the the i'm going to talk about some gdpr stuff um now in, in a little bit more detail and, and and please you know do get in touch if you've got any questions about about what i say but what, what again people tend to get a little bit confused um around around gdpr in terms of the difference between um opting in consent um and legal basis of processing now laura um you remind me what your legal basis of processing um candidates data is um and, and mccurry what's your what's your reason that the basis that you're actually retaining candidates data so we went down the legitimate interest route Great. So that, that's something that, that I recommend, and I have to caveat this um, again, and I say this in every conversation when I'm talking about GDPR. You know what what I want you to 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 understand is that our advice is based on advice that we've had from our legal teams, um, but you should also um, talk to your own your own legal teams. Um, I, I would highly recommend that. Le legitimate interest is a robust 
basis for processing candidate data. Now, um, by basis, um, the, the legal basis of processing data is um, the reason why you're actually holding that candidate data. So don't confuse processing with you know actually taking action. Even if you're storing candidate um, information on a spreadsheet, um, then actually that's considered to be processing, processing candidate data. So you need to be able to, to demonstrate why you're actually retaining that candidate's information. In a recruitment context, there's only really three um, three bases of processing that we can actually use. The first one is contractual necessity, so where you're actually going to offer a candidate a vacancy. <clears throat> so contractually, you need to process that candidate's data in order to, to get their offer out to them, to confirm start dates, to do onboarding, to get them payrolled and, and all that type of thing. So from our side, from a, an attraction engagement conversion perspective, um, contractual isn't really rel uh, relevant, so we can actually put that to one side for the moment. The, that leaves us with the other two bases. Um, the first one is what Laura and McCurrough went down, which is legitimate interest. And then the second one um, is consent. Now, from a, a, a GDPR perspective, you don't need to have any more than one basis of processing. So you can either process candidate data on legitimate interest, or you can process data based on consent. We do recommend uh, legitimate interest, like Laura, uh, like how what Laura and, and McCurrock have actually done as long as you've got a robust enough de defense for it, as long as you clearly state in your privacy policy what the reason is and why you're holding that data, the length of time that you um, expect to hold that data and how the candidate's information should, would actually be used um, whilst you're, you're continuing, continuing to process that data. So um, when a candidate applies for a vacancy, then you can use legitimate interest to retain that data um, because they have um, expressly you know, said, yeah, I want to apply for this position. That's great. And you've then in reply, you should be letting the candidate know what your privacy policy is and what your, your, you know, how the candidate can unsubscribe, how the candidate can exercise their rights under, under GDPR. So, um, you know, we had, um, this email that, that this was the, the first email actually, um, or the second one, can't remember actually. We um, and every single email communication though that was sent out um, from Laura um, on the candidate ID campaign, we told candidates what the privacy policy was, and we told candidates how they would actually exercise their rights under GDPR, and that that's very transparent. It's very open. We're not hiding anything. Do you know? And then actually, and my, my recommendation is, is that every single email that is sent out from your recruitment team, whether it's from uh, an ATS or CRM or whether it's an individual email, you should probably have an unsubscribe and you should all and probably actually give candidates the, the opportunity to, to read your privacy policy um, yeah. as well. It's just a transparent way of doing it. And, and Laura, if I remember rightly, that's something that you and your team now do, you know, with, with every email that goes out, you've got the privacy policy there um, yeah. and you give, give candidates the opportunity opportunity to opt out. Laura, did you have any um, pushback at all from candidates over um, over privacy policy? Did you know? Did taking this approach did it create any any issues? Was there any any downsides to communicating with such a, a high volume of candidates and talking about something as topical as GDPR? No, I think um, because we were so transparent with our privacy policy right from from the beginning. And um, obviously, when you are emailing a very high number of candidates, you do get some level of spam coming back in but, but your guys obviously what managed that that for us um and bear in mind a lot of most of the emails went out prior to the gdpr deadline um but um the majority um were absolutely fine and we're very transparent about how long we'll keep their data for um and we never have any issues at all coming coming back from that so i think as you say it was like the year 2000 and um, we expected it to be this massive influx of issues and it's actually been quite plain sailing touch wood since um, since we, we we put this in place um, we've both got quite a similar background, Laura, in terms of we, we started off in, in Glaswegian agencies, haven't we? Um, and um, you, you worked for search and I, I worked for HRC. Um, and, you know, we're both used to, um, you know, working in fairly aggressive agency environments where email marketing was always a key part of it. You, you yeah. do expect to receive some interesting right. emails 
comes back from candidates. Um, you have a very thick skin having worked in recruitment for so many years that you take it with us all. Absolutely, and and you know we we you know I, what I will say is taking taking this approach to GDPR, you are going to get candidates replying back to you with some interesting comments. However, are you going to get a high volume of candidates doing it? Absolutely oh. not. Um, I can count on two hands. You know, uh, you know how many. Um, Kind of interesting replies we've had since May from candidates, and I and, and I think we've probably sent out the best part of two million emails for our clients yeah. in, in that period of time. So, um, it, it's you know you, you do take it with a pinch of salt, and and but as long as you're doing it properly, and as long as you are being transparent, and as long as you are telling, um, you know, candidates exactly you know how things are going going to work and how they can express, uh, sorry, how they can exercise their their rights under it. Now. The, the other aspect of, of legitimate interest is the ongoing retention um, of, of candidate candidate data. Um, there, there's, there's two points to this. The first one is that, is that the information has to be correct um, and, and up to date. What's important is that uh, is if you can in every single communication um, that, that's sent out, you tell candidates how they can keep their information up to date. Um, and, and we do that um, in Candidate ID, and we did this with McCurrock in a very, very simple and straightforward way. Um, we, we, this is a mobile responsive um, form that was embedded um, in a landing page. It takes candidates 30 seconds to update their details. Um, they can say, you know, what their name, if they've changed any name, um, if they've changed their email address, if they've changed their postcode and their mobile number. Um, this is this is so so easy for candidates to do. It doesn't involve them having to log in to a platform, although that functionality is coming in Candidate ID next year um, to make it a little bit more secure if that's what you want to do as an employer. But actually, we find that logging in to a portal um, just just is another barrier. Um, and and Laura, that that was a conscious decision we made, wasn't it? As part of your project, we we didn't want candidates logging into to your ATS. Um, right because it would have stopped them updating their details yeah. effectively. Yeah, we're very lucky because we, we use ISIMS as the same. We'd, we'd spoken to ISIMS before um, starting this project and ISIMS had agreed with us that we could um, export all the information. They would then do the updates for us on the system. So again, it was no work for, for the team to update all of the updated information. And, and that's a really important point. Um, actually, I should have alluded to um, earlier on. You know, we're we're vendor neutral at Candidate ID. We we you know want to work with um, ATS and C CRM platforms where we can to make it as efficient as possible. So so when you are carrying out this type of work, um, it's important to engage though with your ATS or your CRM vendor from uh, as early an, an opportunity as possible, so that things like bulk updates that is important. You know, you can either do it manually, um, you know, by exporting data from CM, from Candidate ID um, and updating the information on the system, or we can work with you to to actually put uh, put the API and the webhooks in place so that information moves from Candidate ID into your ATS or CRM, um, you know, um, automatically. I, I will say that most vendors are fairly open-minded. We do have one or two vendors who um, shall, shall remain nameless to protect the the, the, the guilty, but um, who are a little bit more stubborn um, about doing doing manual updates. So, um, you know, what I will say is is you know make sure you're using your vendor, make sure you're you're getting the right answer, the answer that you want, um, that's actually in line with the service levels that that you've agreed with them. Um, but don't let them shirk their responsibility um, under under GDPR. I think in the main, um, most have been fairly fairly good about it. Um, but there are some um, um, ATS providers. There's one or two in particular this week who I was talking to clients about where they are still being a little bit stubborn about their responsibility under under GDPR. But but this is, you know, make it easy for your candidates to update their information. Use a landing page, use a form um, to do it. Don't ask candidates to upload load a CV. You know, that's you know, most candidates can't do that from, from their mobile devices still anyway. So, you know, that that one one of the key points around GDPR is making it as easy for the data subjects who who you're engaging with to to to, to update their details and to engage with you, make it as simple and as straightforward as possible. We, we did this um, with, with McCurrock um, um, 
not just with the forums, but also with dedicated landing pages. Now, we, we made this decision because we wanted to select specific content from your website, Laura. Instead of using all the content on the website, we wanted to pick yeah. it um, and put it into these landing pages. Now, we do, though, um, offer tracking, full tracking um, of candidate activity across your website um, as well, guys, if you want it. So we can install a tracking script that means that we can see all candidate activity from when they enter your website until they exit at your website and we can also score that activity accordingly. Um, we are focusing mainly on GDPR today, but what's important to remember is as candidates are engaging with this content, well, whether it's these landing pages, whether it's these forms, whether it's these emails, the candidates are being scored based on their engagement. And that means that actually Laura's team can go into Candidate ID and can have a look and see who's active, who's engaged in the areas. We've got smart searching on Candidate ID, you know, where you can search by job title, by location, by function, which means it's very simple if you're the recruiter that deals with technology roles for you to identify who all the technology candidates are. Yeah. If you're the recruiter that deals with all the sales roles, then you can identify who all the all the sales roles are. But you can then target specifically based on that. So, Laura, we actually did that, didn't we, for one of your vacancies? Yes. You had a vacancy in uh, Brighton, I think it was, wasn't it, for a for a store manager where we found, I think there was about 252, 253 yeah. people in Brighton who had engaged highly with this campaign. Uh, and we were able to then, you know, contact all those people with, with the job vacancy. So again, that contact wasn't coming as a surprise to those candidates because we had nurtured them with this landing page content. They knew who McCurrock were. They knew that actually they were receiving content uh, on a regular basis. And, and importantly, these were people who hadn't unsubscribed already. You know, that, that was automatically updated. Um, you know, if people opted out, if they unsubscribed, they wouldn't receive any, any communication. And this is where that automation part comes in, because actually you, you should have in play a process that, that makes the administration of GDPR as, as light touch as possible. Now, now we are talking about, um, you know, we're, we're not talking about CVs here, we're not talking about potentially sensitive information, we're talking about content here, uh, sorry, information from candidates that is, um, you know, purely based on contact information. You should have, you know, some allowances in your privacy policy for the fact that candidates will send CVs to you. And actually sometimes candidates may unintentionally put some sensitive information. For example, they may put their date of birth, they may allude to their ethnicity, to their gender, and um, they may even include bank details. Some candidates are, are still, unfortunately, um, including bank details, um, uh, national insurance numbers, and, and that type of thing. So just make sure your privacy policy um, can, can, can and deal with that. Um, Laura, we also use text messaging, didn't we? Mm -hmm. um, as, yep. as, as, as part of your campaign as well. Um, text messaging is expensive, um, but it does work very well, um, particularly yep. as a tool for um, re-engaging with candidates who perhaps didn't use use email. Um, on, on average, you know, we find with our clients that the vast majority, um, you know, often, as I said, 60% of candidates will engage with us by email, but for the rest, you can look at using a different channel, um, such as text messaging. You can, though, um, with candidate ID and um, use the, the landing pages and the content across, across social media as well, guys, and, and actually track activity um, across those channels. But in terms of getting a direct message out there to people, um, email and, and SMS um, is, is the kind of most successful, uh, successful way of doing it. So ju just... Um, Moving on to, to the final results there um, from, from a kind of qu a quantitative um, um, element as opposed to qualitative, um, we, we started off with 48,000 candidates. Um, the, the number of active candidates, people who had actually engaged with some form of content um, on candidate ID was 27,358. So that's a massive, massive proportion um, of that database. These were candidates who hadn't actually engaged um, with McCurrock um, in, in some time um, in the main because of the capacity issues. And importantly, out, that meant now that we had, you know, 27,358 candidates who were compliant with, yeah. with GDPR. We were able to clean up um, your ATS by removing the, the just under 21,000 people who weren't compliant um, anymore um, as well. But then the other thing, um, Laura, was the... Um, 
you know the number of candidates who who were generated um a, as a result of it um your, your team were getting alerts by email to tell them who active candidates were who people who were engaged laura i, I don't i don't want to put you on the spot here at all i don't know if you've got any up-to-date figures available in terms of how many candidates have been placed yet um as a result of the campaign but but we did have you know quite a number of placements coming coming through if i remember yeah. rightly um as as a result of this yeah, we had quite a few. I mean, I don't have the, the final numbers, but we had like one example was um we an area we struggled to recruit in is reading, um, and the, the can a candidate from twenty fifteen who had been offered back then but had been counter offered at the time, so didn't take the role. And um, he got in contact as a result of the information that was sent out and he is now working for us. Um had we not sent him the email, um I don't know if he would have saw our, our adverts. So um it just goes to show that um, it was re-engaging with people and, and that raising can be a very difficult area for us to recruit in. So it was a win-win for us. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, the two we, we met the two objectives. We, we automated um, a fair amount of the, the, the GDPR compliance. Um, Laura now has a, a GDPR compliant database that, that's nurtured, that's engaged um, and, um, you know, can be approached about about vacancies. Um, what's next for McCurr, Laura, in terms of, in terms of pipeline, pipelines? Is there anything that you're working on just now? So the team are concentrating on trying to revise the strategy in terms of trying to keep candidates engaged. Obviously, we would love to partner with Candidate ID um, down to budget restraints. In my budget, you haven't started already. That hasn't happened. Um, but longer term, having something like this working in the background would mean it's less work um, for for the team because the team size has is, is never going to grow much bigger than what we are at the moment. Um, and obviously, having our numbers again have increased quite considerably since we last um, took out a check the last time. So we are receiving hundreds if not thousands of applications every other month. Um, so we, we need to try and keep those those candidates engaged. Um, so we're trying to do that manually at the moment, but obviously it's proving, it does prove quite difficult. Um, so to have something running alongside our ATS would be the, the dream um, of ours. Um, so hopefully in some, some point in the future, we'll have that set up. Brilliant. Okay, guys, um, if anyone's got any questions and then, then you know please please do let us know um just just to finish up you know here here's some um, benefits of automating your your gdpr um compliance by by using a, a pipelining process um as a as opposed to to any other um you know I, w I won't read them all out but but they all talk talk for themselves um if you do have any questions, if you've got any queries, then you know please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. We will send out um, a recording uh, of this webinar either today or on Monday, so so please do feel free um, to come back to us um, at any time. Um, Laura, on that note, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Um, I, I really appreciate you you taking time out on a Friday, particularly um, at lunchtime. Um, thanks to everyone who dialed in today. Um, as I said, you'll get a copy of this um, sent out to you by email. Um, I hope you all have a, a wonderful weekend and uh, I hope to speak to you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.